My brain spins in circles. I do not want to think about their excuse to kill you. You, who cared for us in your home. You, who they see as a threat because of your strength and unity and unified resistance. The strength that comes from knowing, defending, and protecting your roots. The strength of the indigenous schools. You, who sat with us barefoot. You, who makes it possible for us to better understand what it means to be in the heart of our bayan. Rest in power. In societies all around the world, processes of colonization have disempowered indigenous communities by robbing them of their languages and endangering their culture and its transmission across generations. But things are changing. All around the world, indigenous peoples are re-empowering themselves through language, using different techniques such as language arts, education, and games. But how can language or linguistics empower indigenous people? The creative arts, in particular language arts and literature, can be a powerful tool to shape society's perception on different social, political, and economic issues. Let us look at how this can be used to empower an indigenous community. Like in many other parts of the world, the Lumet people of Philippines have suffered from the impact of industrialization, militarization, and extrajudicial killings in the corporate and government sector's pursuit of their land. According to the National Commission of Culture and Arts, there have been 68 Lumet murders recorded since 2010. <laughs> These murders have created different movements among the Lumet people and their artists and activist supporters have raised the profile of the injustice of the government to the greater public. One of their supporters is a Filipino activist, Michelle Oroz de Royanas who wrote a poem for indigenous Lumet of the Philippines after her exposure to the Lumet pulse. By using an appraisal analytical approach, we can see the author uses various linguistic techniques to show emotions and feelings in her language in support of the Lumet people. She expresses anger, unhappiness, and dissatisfaction about the status of Lumet because of the killings, industrialization, and militarization. We can see that negative judgment is directed toward the military, the government, and the wealthy Filipinos who have caused the suffering of Lumet. She positions them as those who have disrespected the lives and the rights of the Lumet over their ancestral lands. Note the use of the pronoun we, which implies unity and camaraderie, showing that she belongs to the community. And conversely, she distances herself and an indigenous group from the government, military, and rich Filipinos by the use of the third-person pronouns, such as their and they. She expresses positive judgment of Lumet, shown their unified stance and their capacity to care of each other, their cause and important community situation. She also positively values their strength, which enables them to know, define, and protect their identity, culture, and ancestral land. In the end, Michelle Oroz de Royanes shows that the Lumad people are an inspiration to the causes of social justice and human rights. The Nugon community is one of the largest indigenous groups from southwest of West Australia. Nowadays, 
there are around thirty thousand new people who live in Perth and across the country. The Noongar language became dormant because of the colonization of Australia. Nowadays, only around four hundred people, or one percent of the population, can speak the Noongar language. Because of this, the largest Aboriginal led theatre company in the country, Yer Yakin. Created the Nunga Shakespeare Project in 2011. The project is based on translating and performing Shakespeare's sonnet in the Nunga language. This is part of language revitalization process to maintain and empower their community, celebrate their culture, and positively reinforce their own identity. In the past seven years, members of Yer Yakin have been giving passionate dramatic performances. And the company has continued its work, translating more of the Shakespeare's sonnet and including more community members into the process. This promotion of the language has continued through a serious pilot project with workshops of sonnet readings and local high school programs. Currently, they aim to translate Shakespeare's play Macbeth into the Noongar language and then stage it in a major performance. Education is, of course, what first comes to mind when we think about how we would go about using language and linguistic resources to empower Indigenous communities. In the United States of America, there has been a lot of effort put into restoring the languages of the Sioux tribes of Native Americans. One of their languages, Lakota. Had been an endangered Indigenous language spoken fluently by less than 25% of the population. The two projects we want to showcase are the Lakota Language Project and the Lakota Learning Station. The first, the Lakota Language Project, launched by the Red Cloud Indian School, focuses on a comprehensive curriculum design for young people, which aims to revitalise their Lakota language. The first phase of the project has been implementation of the curriculum in the classroom context. Phase two has been to increase its coverage and enhance its sustainability through encouraging families and communities to become involved. So far, the achievements have been remarkable. Firstly, students' language proficiency has improved significantly. With 67% reported as using Lakota more at home. Secondly, students' learning interest in Lakota culture and history has increased, as well as their sense of identity. In addition, young people have become more engaged in social activities, arts, sport, and educational activities. The second project, the Lakota Language Learning Station. Was launched by the Oseti Wakan organisation in 2008. Through the creation of 44 language learning stations, Oseti Wakan has established a solid foundation for Lakota language learning, both in class and out of class. Again, this project also sought to involve other community members in the language revitalisation efforts. In this case, elders of the community. And again, with significant outcomes, fluent speakers have increased. Jobs were created. Three Native American consultants were hired, and five elders and 14 youth were involved. And additionally, it has had an impact on young people in particular, who have become proud of their language and culture. Now there is the possibility of turning the earlier trend of loss of language around. With a renewed interest by the community's children and youth, to working towards revitalising their own culture through restoration of their language. Back in Australia, Bangala, also Pankala, Bangala, is a sleeping Australian Aboriginal language that was spoken in the Eyre Peninsula of South Australia. It was retrieved through the discovery of 170-year-old documents by a Lutheran missionary, who recorded the language with the intent of translating the Bible. 
Nanyalbo, Nagadu, Bangla, Mirinya, Yari, Yada, Malbu. Narin Yalabu, Nagato, Bangala, Yuri, Yarna, Malbu, Hindu. In 2011, Gilad Zuckerman from the University of Adelaide and the Bangala community launched a reclamation of the language based on those recovered documents. The focus was to keep the Bangala identity, well being, heritage, cultural autonomy, and intellectual sovereignty by reclaiming the language that had not been spoken for over 50 years. Some great educational resources and learning materials have been developed by the revitalization team. The Bangala people are learning their mother language through use of a dictionary, both online and with an app, and with alphabet and grammar books. They are also participating in several workshops held in various locations in South Australia and in community art projects. Although the Bangala Language Reclamation Project is still in its early days, it has developed over time from a 170-year-old document and 1960s audio records to the 2012 Dictionary and Alphabet Book. The Language Reclamation Project has ignited a passion in the Bangala community to relearn their history, cultural songs and dances and important sites. In the Gansi district of Botswana and eastern Namibia in Africa, an endangered indigenous language, Naro, has become the dominant language of trade across speakers of various Koi languages. Previously, Naro was a spoken language only, and other languages, such as English, were seen as more dominant and powerful. The Narrow Language Project was started by the Reformed Church in Dakar village in the 1980s to revive the language and give it more credence among its community members. The project leaders involved in the whole Narrow community, children, parents and community leaders, and entrusted the elders with the direction and use of Narrow literacy. As a result, the language now can be written and be published. Parents have a more positive attitude towards their children's language learning. The language becomes an asset for socio-economic advancement and promotion of cultural tourism. The District of British Columbia is home to 60% of the First Nations languages in Canada, with 32 distinct languages. At the time of colonization, 100% of the First Nations people in British Columbia were fluent speakers of at least one First Nations language, though multilingualism was the norm. Today, due to state-sanctioned policies of assimilation, there are only 5.1% fluent speakers of the First Nations language, most of them being elders. To revitalize the First Nations languages in British Columbia, the Master Apprentice program has been set up. It is a one-on-one -on -one language immersion program where a mentor who is a fluent speaker is paired up with the apprentice, a learner. The mentor and apprentice spend 300 hours per year together doing everyday activities using the languages at all times. In this program, learners become more fluent which is especially valuable for languages where only a couple of fluent speakers are left. The Master Apprentice program has brought lots of the positive changes to the communities who have participated in the program. Firstly, since 2008, the program has reported over 30 apprentices who are now fluent in their indigenous language. Secondly, the decline of the fluent speakers has slowed over the years. Additionally, Learning their indigenous languages has improved the well-being and the health of indigenous people. Lastly, apprentices all showed positive attitudes toward their language, as well as their willingness to pass it on. Younger generations in indigenous communities understand the importance of the link between themselves and their ancestral culture. More and more people begin to express their willingness to participate in the revitalization of their language.
Across the world, speakers of endangered languages are using games to revitalize their mother tongues. Games form a common part of students' lives, and they can be used explicitly for educational purposes. They may also have implicit or incidental outcomes that improve students' skills, development, and abilities in many other areas, including language acquisition and retention. Let us show you an example of how the popular word game Scrabble has been translated into the Dakota language and is being used as a linguistic tool for intergenerational teaching of this at-risk language. Speaking their native languages was actively discouraged and forbidden for the Sioux Indian population on reservations during colonization. Today, Dakota is critically endangered. Among around 20 Southern Dakota people, only 290 are fluent speakers, and these are all elders. The Dakota Language Scrabble Initiative is one of the many revitalization projects undertaken by the Sioux community to combat the language loss. It was developed to make learning Dakota fun and entertaining for young people. It started in schools and ended up in people's homes. The Dakota Scrabble game has provided potential. It has stabilized the language, given the learners and speakers linguistic pride in their language, and given the Dakota language more prestige. Today, the project has expanded from the Scrabble game to a 207-page Scrabble dictionary with 2,500 words in the Dakota language. Based on the nature of language and the responses of indigenous people towards the projects, each and every one makes a valuable contribution to the empowerment of indigenous languages and their communities. However, the whole premise of nature of evidence needs to be taken into account. Better outcomes could be demonstrated by being more involved primarily with the people in their communities to assess the effectiveness of each project. The influence of language arts example of Lumet poem could be assessed by conducting research into people's responses and active involvement with the issue after they had read the poem. Moreover, going to each community and conducting quantitative and qualitative assessments of each project could give more clarity to the evidence of each project's efficacy. These indigenous languages and communities have suffered enough. We can make a change. If these projects prove that we can do something to empower indigenous people through language and linguistics, why don't we?